Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net, and follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives. Also, become one of our more than 4,000 friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. Well, before we do get started, I do want to remind you the program's brought to you by the financial support of our listeners, and you can support the show at support.greatdetectives.net. Now it's time for today's episode of The Adventures of Philip Marlowe, the original air date, November 5th of 1949, and the title is A Fine Italian Hand. Get this and get it straight. Crime is a sucker's road, and those who travel it wind up in the gutter of the prison of the grave. There was a broken body in a quiet house, gunplay on a merry-go-round at midnight, and a boy and a girl in love running away, all because of one man's fine Italian hand. From the pen of Layman Chandler, outstanding author of crime fiction, comes his most famous character in The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. Now, with Gerald Moore, starring as Philip Marlowe, we bring you tonight's exciting story, The Fine Italian Hand. The day just passed has been full of jarring contrast. Laughter hiding heartbreak. A woman dying of loneliness in an overcrowded city. A man who sacrificed everything to make a fortune and shot himself when he got it. The messed up byproducts of our hopped up civilization. The thought of them stayed in my mind as I drove over the freeway to San Fernando Valley because the job I was on promised no change in the day's pattern of combining things that didn't belong together. When I parked at the corner of Magnolia and Van Nuys Boulevard, I was still trying to reconcile my new client, the owner and operator of a little amusement park for children with a panicky voice on the phone that had begged me to come at once. It wasn't hard to spot. A heavy-set old man moving among the stampeding merry-go-round stallions and picking crumpled tickets like plums from the fists of laughing kids grabbing for brass rings. We never changed, do we? When he saw me, he hopped off. Me, me, take off me. Take off me. You, Mr. Marlowe, maybe? That's right, Mr. D'Angelo. Oh, Mr. Marlowe, come this way to my little office. Right. We've got to talk right away. No time must to wait. Uh, oh, that's a nice little boy. I'm very proud of you. Now, you take your free ride with the Nick. i got to talk us on the business. Goodbye. Come in, Mr. Marlowe. Please, uh, sit down. Thanks. Mr. Marlowe, I'm a very worried man. Yeah, I know about your son you said on the phone. What sort of trouble is he in, Mr. D'Angelo? He's a good boy, my Bernardo. He's been to college. He's a veteran from the war with two bronze stars and a purple heart. <laughs> Look, there's his picture in his uniform. Ah. He's a good boy. Sure, sure. Now he's in a jam, is that it? Yeah. He's in a jam with a gambler. A man in name is Safran. You know this man? Yeah, slightly. Frank Safran's a bad boy. Does your son owe him money or what? No, 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 no. My boy not throw his money away like that. No. It's about a girl. Oh. Which way does it go? She's Saffron's girl and Bernardo's making a play for her? That's or... right. That's right. This girl belongs to the gambler and my boy is taking her out. Oh, fine. He won't tell me nothing. I find out just the same. Maybe he's just playing the big shot. And maybe he really loses his heart. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Now, it's gone too far. Now, there's a trouble. My boy's going to be killed or he's going to kill somebody. And I don't know what to do. Well, what makes you think it's gone that far, Mr. D'Angelo? Maybe Saffron will just get tough and scare Bernardo off, huh? Scare off? No, no, Mr. Marlowe. My boy going to scare off. He's a pretty tough. He's a champion with the golden glove. Really? Yes, but tonight, I better no help him. Bernardo come home tonight with his face all beat up. He won't tell his papa nothing. All he says is that the red-faced dog, I'm going to get even, I'm going to kill him. He's just a crazy man. My Bernardo, he, he won't listen to me. He pushed me away and he go out again. Red face. Doesn't fit Saffron. 
You sure he was the one who had your son beat up? Oh, sure, of course. Who else? Mm. And just because of this dancer, this Paula. I don't even know her last name. Paula, huh? Yeah. What do you think I can do about this, Mr. D'Angelo? Chase Bernardo down and bring him home? No, no, that's no good. My Bernardo, he's too, too headstrong. No, Mr. Marlowe, I must find out something. I must find out if this girl is using my boy for a plaything or if she's really in love with him. What difference does that make with Stefan? Well, if this girl really loves my boy, then i do anything to bring them together. Anything. Now, if this is only a game she plays, then... Si va così, così si va. What does that mean, Pop? Oh, that, that means if it goes that way, that's the way it goes. Uh-huh. And I know what I got to do. So you find out this for me, please. Well, I don't know, Pop. It's not the kind of thing I like. Look, I... look I know I ask you to spy on somebody. Just to find out for me. <laughs> I can't talk so good. My, with you, it's not so hard. I know, Pop, but please, really. Please, My boys and mama die, and now Bernard is all I got for life. He's a good boy. He should not get into trouble just for a cheap game of love. Don't you understand me? I understood him. And from what I knew of Frank Saffron, he had plenty to worry about with a hot-headed son who didn't know when to quit. Or maybe it was Saffron who didn't know when to quit. That thought plus the 50 bucks in advance sold me. Mr. D'Angelo gave me a description of the girl he'd seen, but once told me that Bernardo had moved away from home, he didn't know where. But the park closed at 10 and that he'd be there all night, and that was all. My first step was to locate the dancer named Paula. So outside, I said nickel to a phone until I called everything from ballet to burlesque. But got no Paula. Which left only Frank Saffron's easy money mill. It was a ranch house, California style, tucked under the hills south of Ventura, on a dead end called Sunburst. That's where I got the nod at the peekaboo window. I wandered through the bar and past the dice table to the door at back marked private and went in. A tuxedoed rock yeah. pile with a boy of lobster yeah, complexion frowned up at me from the telephone as he Listen, talked. He waggled a thick, hairy show. finger. Two heads so I took the hint and waited now quietly for him to finish. the whole thing over again. I don't care if it takes you a week. This joint don't soak up no five grand shortages. You guys find it. Goodbye. Well, what's on your mind, Toots? I don't seem to remember you being announced. It isn't a formal call. I'm just looking for an old friend. We don't have any old friends to spare, Toots. That figures. Mine's Paula. She's a dancer. I understand that Mr. Saffron knows her quite well. He might tell me what I can get in touch with her, huh? Oh, so you're a friend of Paula Baker's, huh? Yeah, that's right. From way back. Well, that's all. Touch you through. Her name's not Baker. That came right out of thin air. Now, what do you really want? Take it easy, boy. She's just cagey with last names, that's all. She gave us Jones. Who's that? The Duncan Department Store, credit section. 300 bucks worth. I got this far in her references, and I want to see Mr. Saffron. Well, he's not in. I'll take it up with him later. If it was his time, you'll hear from us. Make it easy on yourself, Max. Just tell me where I can find it. Out that door there. You got the whole city to look in. And take your crummy business. Okay, okay. Now you're getting pushy. Hey. Hey, blushing boy. One thing more. Uh, What's your name? I want to get it straight when I tell you that. so it wasn't a total loss. I'd managed to keep the back door open long enough to snap off the night latch. And I'd met the red-faced man who no doubt supervised the beating Bernardo had taken earlier. I kicked plenty of noise out of the iron steps going down, and then I crossed the parking lot, leaned back against the wall, and waited. Halfway through, my first cigarette bunker came out, got in his car, and drove away. I watched him out of sight, then slipped back in quietly, located Saffron's 8x12 desk, and started through it. In the top drawer, I found first a letter with a gambler's home address on it. And under that, a picture. One of smiling lovely who posed in front of a dance studio on Wilshire. She wore Paula's description like a snug pair of slacks, and dance instruction was a field in the fine art of hoofing that I'd overlooked completely. I closed the drawer and started out when I heard someone coming. I jammed my cigarette into the ashtray and ducked back against the door frame as the cleaning woman bustled in. Uh, moldering cigarette butt. <laughs> the wonder this trap don't burn to the ground. <laughs> Hey, somebody's been in here. Hold it quiet, baby. Shut up and I'll let you have some air again. Is it a deal? Okay. Hey, hey you don't belong here, mister. Neither do you, beautiful. Let's forget we saw each other, huh? Look, I'm a trusted employee uh, here. I... Silence is golden. How golden? Five bucks worth. And if I hear one peep out of you before I get out of here, I'll come back someday and put glue in your soap bottles. <laughs> Goodbye, baby. 
The band studio is presently glossy from a social modernistic facade on Wilshire Boulevard to its far from old-fashioned receptionist inside. Who signed me up, expressed sympathy over my rusty rumber, and assured me that since I'd heard so much about her, I could have Paula, that is, Miss Calvin, while on duty as my instructress. If I'd only be so kind as to step this way. So I stepped this way. Into a ballroom with a black burnished floor that looked as deep as the night sky, and after a deft hand signal from the receptionist, Paula Calvin glided toward us. Introductions were made. How do you do? And suddenly. The room was filled with the soft beat of a rumba band, and we were off. <laughs> Rusty or not, it would have been fun. If I hadn't had work to do, that part was tough. You're doing beautifully, Mr. Marlowe. Just loosen up now and relax, huh? Yeah, I'll try. I'm glad I drew you as my instructor, Miss Calvin. Mm-hmm. Bernie said you were top. Told me to insist on you and accept no substitutes. Bernie? Uh-huh. D'Angelo. You remember him, don't you? Yes. Yes, of course, I remember him. Nice guy, Bernie. Good kid. Don't you think so? Uh, keep your feet a little closer together, Mr. Marlowe. Don't be afraid to use your knees. You know, baby, Bernie's got everything. Look, brains, even a temper, just to keep life interesting. Isn't that right, Paula? Guy thinks a lot of you, doesn't he? Hey, I'm talking I to you. I heard you. The next question, I suppose, is... How did I feel about him? Yeah. Now it's your turn to loosen up and relax, baby. Listen, I resent being checked up on by anybody. When I want Bernie D'Angelo to know how I feel, I'll tell him. And when I want Frank Saffron to know, I'll tell him, too. And if you came here tonight for a Roomba lesson, and I'm old Mother Hubbard. Okay, Mother Hubbard. I want to find out one thing. Are you in love with Bernie D'Angelo? That's nobody's business but mine, mister. You could be real wrong about that, baby. Then it's my mistake that I'll make it all by myself, huh? Have you seen Bernie tonight? No, I haven't. And that's all the conversation you get. You can have the rest of your room, though, if you want it. No, thanks. I'll see you around, Paula. <laughs> The next best bet for finding what my client wanted was a talk with Saffron. I stopped and called his gambling client, but he was still out. So I drove up into Coldwater Canyon to number 8100. The first real hint that something was wrong was a curtain dangling at a crazy angle over one of the lighted windows. Next it was the front door standing six inches open, and inside, the legs of an overturned table sticking up in the air, and then pieces of a broken lamp littering the floor. That was only the beginning. I nudged the door open and stepped in. It was a mess. I saw his feet first from behind the couch. It only took one glance at his face. Frank Saffron had been literally beaten to death by a pair of very fast, very deadly fists. Don't move one inch, Jocko. Do I take three guesses or turn around and look? Bernardo with gun. Oh, I got it all right. It was his. Automatic, caliber 45, and I'll use it if I have to. Who are you? Name's Marlowe. One of Saffron's boys? You got a real talent for being wrong, haven't you, kid? Who are you? A private detective hired by one Ambrosio D'Angelo. Papa? Yeah. Because he was worried sick about his boy. But I told him to stay out of it. I told him it was my business. And you did a nice, thorough job of handling it. You did this, didn't you? Yeah. Saffron had it coming to him. I was beat up tonight on his orders. I came here to pay him back, but I didn't intend to kill him. What'd you stick around for? I didn't stay He looks to me like he's been dead over an hour. I left, then I got worried, and I came back just a few minutes yeah, ago. Yeah, yeah, I... I know. You found out he was dead, huh? Well, I guess I better call I the guess police. you better stand still. If you're really working for my old man, if you really want to help him, the best thing you can do is to get out of here and shut up about this until tomorrow morning. I don't work that way, kid. I'm going to call your old man and the police, and we're going to sit here until they show up. You won't give me a break. Not that kind. If you run, you haven't got a chance. We'll just have to see about that. I'm sorry it turned out this way, but it didn't. I got a lot of things to do. So take your ethics, Marlowe, and sleep on them! Oh! Bernie! Bernie, don't run! Come back! In just a moment, the second act of Philip Marlowe. But first, 
With thousands of dollars of wonderful prizes, Sing It Again is fun for the whole family to play. Make a date to listen over most of these CBS stations every Saturday night. Now, with our star, Gerald Moore, we return to the second act of Philip Marlowe and tonight's story, The Fine Italian Hand. I splashed some water on my face and wobbled over to the telephone that was spilled across the floor near Frank Saplin's broken body. It was too late to do anything more constructive than call my client and... Before he heard it from the police, tell him what his boy, Bernardo, had been up to. The kind of job I'd have given a loose an eye tooth to get out of. So when I dialed his number and got no answer, I was glad. Even though it didn't quite figure that the elder D'Angelo shouldn't be in. Now there was absolutely nothing to do but call the police or... Get away from that phone. Don't pay attention to a man who just stepped into the room. A man with a red face who also held a gun in hand. Oh, well, the department store, Dick. Look how he gets around. Or is it just that Frank's last name was Jones, too? You're overworking a bum joke. Also, I didn't do this. And who did? And how do you figure in around here and over at the club? Come on, smart guy. Let's level. First, who are you? The name? Marlowe. And the trade? Private detective. Hired by who? Come on, let's not pull teeth. Who are you working for, Marlowe? Quiet old guy named D'Angelo. Does nothing worse than run a merry-go-round for kids. Mean anything? Yeah. Quiet old guy. D'Angelo. Yeah, yeah, that must be the punk's old man, huh? Which means that the kid, Bernie, must have done this, right? Yeah, he did it. But only after he got cut up this afternoon by the late Mr. Saffron here, or representative. That's not me, Rover boy. I never messed in Frank's private life any more than I could help. Which means what? That I take Bernie D'Angelo one night to a flat he has over on Lancashire near Moore Park. A flat on Lancashire? What number? I don't know. The first house off the corner of Moore Park on the south side. He just moved in. Well, what's the difference, what now? Don't move, Marlowe, or I'll knock you flatter in that handkerchief. What handkerchief? That one by the body. Oh, yeah. With the initial D.A. The apostrophe A is in D'Angelo. That does it. Okay, Buster, put away the house. I'll leave quietly. For where? For a crack at that flat in Lancashire near Moore Park south side. Why? So that if the kid's still around, I can stop him without calling the cops. And only rattle him into losing his grip altogether. Which would mean lots of firepower, and a kid sooner or later dead in the gutter. What's wrong with that? A couple of things. But in particular, what it might do to Ah, uh, yeah, I know. To a nice old guy who runs a merry-go-round for kids. Nuts. So long, sucker. How it says, Lord. Eat it before I start crying. <laughs> Bernie D'Angelo's flat on Lancashire turned out to be second floor rear and all that went with it. From the stout landlady to the very public payphone to the faint line of naked, unfrosted light bulbs. The weak to disturb the shadows in the corridor. Plus, of course, the unhappy marriage of a half a dozen distinct cooking odors sneaking out of the transoms of his many rooms where cooking was strictly prohibited. Bernie had room nine at the end of the L-shaped hall. And when I turned and started for his door, I was glad to see yellow light oozing out of the cracks. And to hear a tinny phonograph making not so grand, grand opera. When I knocked, I did it with a barrel of my thirty-eight. Yeah? Who is it? Connor! You better turn that phonograph down. We can't hear ourselves think out here. Okay, I'll take care of it. Goodbye. Not so fast, Junior. Take care of it now. I don't want to have to come out here again. It'll make me feel nasty. Does that come across? Yeah, real clear. Oh, oh, yeah, Ma, don't get back all the way. Cut it off. Quit shoving. Oh, quit shoving. What do you want with me? Conversation for a starter. Turn that thing off. Now we're going to talk, Bernie. About what? Not my old man again. That's a waste of time. What's done is done, Marlowe. You know that. Yeah, and I also know you'll never get any place running. Unless we try real hard. Don't turn around, Marlowe. Oh, fine. Madame Lazanga. Take his gun, Bernie. Throw it over there. Yeah. If you please, Mr. Connor. How stupid did you think we were, Marlowe? Or had you forgotten all about Paula here? No, I hadn't forgotten. Just figured she might be on the other side. Then you figured wrong because there's never been any other side. Never been anybody but Bernie from the moment we met. Which is why you kept dating Frank Saffron? Which is exactly why I kept dating Frank Saffron. I didn't want him jealous and gunning for Bernie. I didn't want trouble. Mm. Now that you got it, you don't want to let it go, is that it? What do you mean, Marlo? Yeah, I mean if you turn yourself in now tonight, there's still a chance you'll get off easy. Yeah, and a better chance that he won't. All right. But even then, it'll only be manslaughter, prison for a few years. This way, it's got to be worse. Hide and seek from here on out for both of you right up to the end. No matter when that is. Look, honey, maybe... No, Marlo... maybes, Bernie. I don't want you rotting away in jail and me rotting away on the outside because you accidentally killed Frank Saffron. Now, come on, Bernie. Let's get out of here. 
Put him in this closet here. Yeah, yeah, sure. Hey, look, Marlo, if you, if you do go back to Pop, tell him I wish it had been different, will you? Why? So he can eat his heart out a little more? No dice, kid. Shut the door. The sight of you is making me sick. Okay, fella. Shut it in. And shut it see. Best had been swinging wild, hoping that a lucky punch, no matter how low, would connect and jar some sense back into the kid. But it had played differently, and as I started to kick the lock on the closet door, I knew now that Bernie D'Angelo resented me and probably his father along with the rest of the world. It wouldn't give him an even break. All in all, it was the kind of thing that made me mad enough to do the trick! handsome or fight over the girl or don't you like the way the furniture's arranged? Which? Neither. Before you get too upset about this land lady, I'll cut you in on something. Mm. The minute after I get to your phone, every cop in town is going to be looking for your star border. Because tonight, Bernie D'Angelo killed a man. Yeah, it's got nothing to do with the stuff you've wrecked. Come on, handsome, let's settle up. There's one splinter door and a oh, smack bend over there. A lot of little pieces that used to be a vase. That broken box, box over there with them papers in it ain't mine. It's no charge. Okay, uh, how much... Uh, how much do you want? How much? Well, uh, um... Twenty... Twenty-five of... Uh, Thirty with the vase. Thirty bucks and all. Well, handsome, what is it? What you staring at? Hmm? Oh, uh, this slip of paper here. Fell out of the box. He sold a lot of other papers. Can't hurt you. It's only a receipt. What's the fuss? Because it is a receipt, Granny, from of all places at the apartment store. A receipt for a what? present delivered a long time ago. What? Yeah, it's got to be. All right, Granny, here. 30, you said, huh? Mm-hmm. And 20, 25, mm-hmm. 30. 30 bucks. And if I'm right, sweetheart, I'll send you another vase come Christmas. Now, forget what I said about the phone and Bernie's being a killer. Because a mistake may have been made all the way around. What kind of mistake? Handsome? A big one, abuse. And I can't be more specific than that until I find the elder Mr. D'Angelo. Good night, Granny. <laughs> By midnight, the San Fernando Valley is always sound asleep. So I covered the five miles back to the amusement park and close to as many minutes worrying all the way that either my hunch was wrong and I was heading no place or that it was right and I was too late to keep murder from happening again. When I was out of my car and moving quietly in between the dark machines to stop being gay, bobbing animals when the kids were gone, I knew that I could quit worrying altogether. Because standing ahead, in close to the merry-go-round, was Mr. Ambrosio D'Angelo. And opposite him, holding a gun that I'd already seen once tonight, was Lou Bunker, the man I figured had killed Frank Stefan. And when I was within a dozen yards of him, it played okay, just stop like that. that. Far enough. Stop right where you are and turn around. Why? So you can hit me over the back of the head and kill me like it was accident, huh? I fall in the dark while I work on the merry-go-round, huh? Pretty smart the guy, mister. That way, no Ambrosio D'Angelo to testify that you killed Frank Saffron. No, my boy, for now. Turn around and quit yapping. Nobody told you to go peeking in the windows and to play drop the hanky when you went inside to make sure that I killed Frank Saffron. It was all your own idea. Yeah, and brilliant. Drop it, Bunker. Mr. Marlowe, look out. Mr. Marlowe. You won't get far, Buster. Believe me. Mr. Marlowe. Mr. Wall, look out, look out. He's hiding over there on the, on the merry-go-round. All right, Pop. I know, I know how to get him out of where we... Yes, yeah, so get down. Pop, Pop, are you all right? It's all right. That's okay, Mr. Marlowe. This is scratchy. Don't worry about me. Just to get ready for Bunker because I'm going to go over there next to the switch. Uh-huh. He can't hide no more, Mr. Marlowe. I'm going to start the merry-go-round and make him join us all around. I go now. Bunker, you want to make it to our hospital? Fill in the blank fast. Come on, why did you kill Saffron? Come on! Okay. I dipped into the till at the club and dummied up the books to cover. He was going to find out about it, so I went to his place to get him. Bernie got there first, huh? Yeah. They had a fist fight, and after he left, I, I went in and... And to finish him off with your feet, I see that. I went there, Mr. Marlowe, because I was worried about Bernardo. I had to do something. How did you know that D'Angelo was there, Bunker? Oh, Marlo, please. Come on, it. keep talking. Well, I... I heard a noise when I was inside. So I left and doubled back. He was inside then, but I only knew that it was an old man. I didn't know who he was until later when I came back a second time, when you were there and saw that handkerchief. It hadn't been there before. Then when you talked about the old man here, I, oh, I figured the D'Angelo initials could fit him. Ah! Because... Oh, 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 oh
Scusa, ma è voi, Bernardo! Bernardo, sono qui! Ehi, ma è Bernardo! Ehi, ma che bello Bernardo! Look, look, come si fa lo? The girl is with him. They didn't run away, did they? No, they didn't run away. That's it, Mr. D'Angelo. Welcome your boy home. It's going to be tomorrow morning before all the policemen are finished talking with my boy and Paula. That's right. But after that, everything okay. Mm-hmm. Okay, just because you talk smart to do both of them at Bernardo's flat. Just because of what you said. Well, that and what they were smart enough to do, D'Angelo. I don't think it was easy for them to change their minds and come back to what could have been prison. No, I guess not. Ma è anche un kind of you that there won't be no prison and there won't be a funeral for me. <laughs> But you know, that's what the, that's what I don't understand, Mr. Marlowe. What? When you tell the policeman that you know where to come and find the loop bunker at my place because of the department store receipt, I get all mixed up. Uh-huh. I can uh, oh uh, I get off here, please. All right, Bob. Well, the receipt was for handkerchiefs monogram D A, Mr. D'Angelo, which would have been sent to you as a gift from your son. I put the idea in my mind that the handkerchief I saw at Frank Sapphins could be yours, not Bernardo's. Oh, I could see it, sir. Well, Mr. Marlowe, we are forever your good friends. Now I say goodbye in here. Hey, wait a minute. Wait a minute, Pop. This is miles from your place. I don't mind driving you home. Oh, no, 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 no. That's all right. That's all right. I, I just want to go around the corner. Uh, an old friend of mine is there. Oh. I... I want to tell him all about uh, D'Angelo's good luck. Thank you, just the same, Mr. Marlowe. Arrivederci. I watched him walk away. A quiet old man in a quiet, empty street. A grateful old man. Who at three o'clock in the morning had to find his friend. And tell him all about the D'Angelo good luck. And then, when he was around the corner and out of sight, I found myself wondering who the old friend could be. But a minute later, when I had driven as far as the corner and could see which way Ambrosio D'Angelo had gone, I knew. It was less than half a block away. The familiar Gothic architecture. Stone, stained glass. And the steeple reaching for the sky. And... Yeah, his old friend. Adventures of Philip Marlowe, bringing you Raymond Chandler's most famous character, star Gerald Moore, and are produced and directed by Norman MacDonald. Script is by Robert Mitchell and Gene Levitt. Featured in the cast were Georgia Ellis, Jay Novello, Paul Dubois, Barney Phillips, Ann Morrison, and Vivi Janis. The special music is composed and conducted by Richard Oran. Be sure and be with us next week when Philip Marlowe says... This time I took a beating from a clever Chinese, ran into a twisted corpse in an alley, and watched death strike on the railroad tracks, all because of an open-toed banjo which was jinxed from the start. Welcome back. Uh, this was another great episode of The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. And I like the, uh, ending. There, there always seems, they always seem to want to put in something that's profound or uplifting. And usually it's pretty good. This episode's no exception. Well, I'm going to, uh, bef- address something that I've mentioned in a couple other uh, programs. Uh, We did it, I think, on the last episode of Man from Homicide and last week's episode of Nick Carter. 
And that is that we'll soon be doing the Ellery Queen radio series. Classic Ellery Queen radio had a feature uh, with the armchair detectives uh, where uh, people would listen to the first part of the broadcast and would offer their opinion on who did it before the reveal of the actual uh, killer by Ellery Queen. However, a lot of programs have this portion of the show missing. There were a few non-Ellery Queen programs where this wasn't included or it's been edited out. And uh, others like Armed Forces Radio Services typically have those parts edited out. So I wanted to have thought that it would be a great idea to see if we could uh, recreate these missing uh, segments with actual listeners, uh Basically, answer a couple questions about yourself and what you do, and then you take a guess at who done it. And we would record this by some sort of conference call. And I'd like to uh, ask a couple of things. First, we would need probably a good number of listeners who would be willing to be armchair detectives. And two, if you're not interested, I'd like to hear what you think about the idea. Uh, send me your thoughts at box13 at greatdetectives.net. Now we turn to uh, listener comments and feedback, and we have one from Brian, who comments regarding Man from Homicide, and in particular the Donald Shellbarger murder. Uh, wow, this show is way over the top, but it was enjoyable. I kept wondering if a cop in those days would really get away with half the stuff he did. Um, well, um, I think... It really would probably depend on the uh, police department, because uh, there are some departments where you might be able to get away with more than others. Um, but uh, in general, this probably would not be recommended practices in a modern uh, police department of uh, the early 1950s, which is why it landed on Tuesday instead of on Saturday, where we would air a kind of procedural show. Because this is, as you say, pretty far away from what most uh, policemen would do. But thanks so much for the comment, Brian. And uh, that will do it for today. Join us tomorrow for Nick Carter. And then next Wednesday, be sure and listen for another episode of The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. In the meantime, send your comments to box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives. 